Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I have a really exciting show for you today. I have two successful individuals uh, who are fathers, investors, educators, and mentors, have been doing this a while and have helped thousands of people. Why don't we welcome Jake and Gino to the show. How are you guys doing? Michael, thanks for having us on. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you doing, Jake? Doing great. Thanks for having us. Excellent. Well, why don't we just jump in? Why don't we go with Jake first? Tell us, you know, sort of where you are in the country, how long you've been doing this, what, what sort of makes your day these days, Jake? Yeah, so I'm located in Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, my, my first experience with the, the G-Daddy down there for the folks on the, uh, the YouTube was, a, was an angry man. I was actually uh, running around with his brother. We were going to Yankee games and doing a bunch of caterings, and people talk about, you know, maybe you got a guy that's in the front of the house or the face of the business. Well, Gino's brother, Mark, was running the restaurant, so he was interacting with guys like myself. I was a pharmaceutical rep. We were doing a lot of caterings, and so he was entertaining, and you know, we're just having a, a grand old time as you know, friends, Yankee fans, whatever. And I would always come to the restaurant, and I would see this guy in the back, and and for the folks on YouTube, I got my arms crossed for the. <laughs> that he was just angry, and he always looked pissed off, and I was like, Mark, what's what's going on with your brother? And he's just like, Oh no, he, no, Gino's a really nice guy. So we didn't, Gino and I didn't really know each other that well uh, prior to getting into our business. And it took a few years, but I finally got fed up with the, the high taxes and the, and the crummy weather in New York. So I decided to take a lateral transfer just for quality of life sure. and took my wife and headed, headed down to Tennessee. And the day before I left, uh, Marco really introduced me to his brother Gino that day and said that, you know, Jake is going down to Tennessee, potentially looking at also doing real estate uh, because I had, I had doctors that were uh, still had their autonomy. And what I mean by this is over the last 10 years, medical groups have started buying up all these doctor practices. Mm, yeah. And there was one doctor that stood out specifically that didn't get bought out by the medical group. And it was because he didn't need it. He literally, this is, this is a great guy, Dr. Neshwat, uh, for those folks in Northern Westchester, owns real estate from Florida all the way to the Canadian border. Okay. Wow. And he was just able to keep his autonomy because he wasn't dependent on that one stream of income. And I found that fascinating. So that always resonated with me. So the day before I left, uh, saying goodbye to Marco and, and he told Gino about this and he said, I got to get you to talk to my brother before you go. So literally we open up the laptop and he starts looking at deals in Knoxville. And this was probably uh, early 2011, late 2010 at the time. Okay. And seeing stuff that's trading for 30,000 a unit. And that, that seemed great to me. I was just looking for yield. I was looking to you know, some kind of protection because my comp uh, my corporate job was doing layoffs every year. So Gino's eyes get real wide and I said, okay, let, let's take a chance at this. And, uh, you know, two years later, two and a half years later, actually from that point, after a ton of rejection and Gino and I sticking together, uh, you know, a lot of phone calls, a lot of, a lot of late night uh, chats on the phone. We, we finally kicked down the door and got into our first unit. So. So Michael, to, to, I guess, piggyback off of that, um, Jake forgets to mention that he moved to Knoxville for six months by himself. So everyone thinks it's easy. Just pick up, you leave a mark. And he was down there for six months without his wife, renting I'm an apartment. So I, really was. Was. I know you are. And, and, and that's part of the story, right? So we end up actually, the apartment that he rents, we end up looking at it about a year and a half ago, looking to buy it. So he walks into that leasing office and the leasing agent's like, you look familiar. He's like, yeah, I rented here five years ago. Now I want to buy you. So I <laughs> Orange and unit complex, right? 27 million bucks. So that's part of the cool story. But I think it's also about knowing your why. I think Jake knew his why to move down there for six months by himself. When, when he moved down there, uh, we started looking for deals. He ends up buying a home. So it, it slows down our progress. I'm like, okay, we're still going to stick with it. Um, you know, everyone says, well, it's a great time to buy. Not really. The economy stunk. There wasn't that much money. Um, rents were really, really depressed. We were buying we we're buying units, one bedrooms. They were renting for three fifty a month. These units. Yeah. So what do you think the value? The demand wasn't the same then either, guys. I wanted. To yes. Clear. Yeah. That, that's the other thing. People like go back and go, "Oh, they were so great." You know, they were great deals because there was a lot of risk because we didn't know where the market was going. We didn't know the economy was going. So I mean, I me at the time, uh, I had you know, I had a big family. I'm like, I want to get out of New York but I want to buy stuff in Knoxville. So Jake was the boots on the ground. He was the property manager, created the property management company. We learned by, by fire. It took us 18 solid months to find a deal, even in a market that had deals. We found the deal three months after our first one, we found our second one. 
And that's when I think I said to myself, wow, this can become from a little couple thousand dollars a month cash flow to something pretty substantial. If we can find a money partner, we did. We found a really good partner in Mike and our first thousand units that we purchased, we've been able to purchase just us. We weren't smart enough to syndicate deals. We didn't know what syndication was five, six years ago. That wasn't the, that wasn't the catch word. It was just, okay, we'll refi and roll our deals. We've been able to refinance $9 million out of our portfolio and put it into the next deal. We didn't know syndication. If we'd known it, maybe we would have done it sooner or maybe we would have taken a chance. We just felt comfortable with our own money. Um, we've syndicated two deals in the last six months and we're on a third deal right now in syndication. But you know, to all the listeners out there, there are so many different ways to get into multifamily. People have all these objections, whether they're too young, they're too old, they don't have money. We've got students who are in their 20s, we've got students in their 60s, we've got students with, with money, without money. I think the mindset is, how do I get into it? Do I want to do it day to day? Do I want to raise money for somebody else's deal? Do I want to syndicate my own deals? Do I want to partner up with four other people? Where do I want, I want to buy? There's so many questions. Just the thing is you need to get educated. And Jake and I, I fortunately had some of the education. I went through real estate coaching. I had the life coaching. So I knew what to look for. I knew how to underwrite deals. And it was just a matter of getting some of that financing, getting some of those pieces and getting a partner on with us. And that was, was fortunate with us. And then obviously we learned on fire as far as doing the property management and scaling up and you know that's that's how it started but it's only been five or about six years since we started we bought our first deal so it can really accelerate once you get the clarity and once you start building systems and once you start onboarding investors and partners on it can really it can really you know take a life of its own you know you see that up in the top left there one rental at a time <laughs> yeah. see that, that is saying that slogan yeah we, we're firm believers that it only takes one the folks that we know yes. in this game that have done multiple deals it is just about everyone. Either you've, you've done zero or you've yes. done one and you're continuing to do more. So it's that momentum, one rental. And that's what it was for us. I, I, that really resonates with me. We bought our first deal. We got kicked in the face a couple of times, punched in the gut. We learned, we did another one. We did another one after that. And it's just consistently uh, since 2013, we've been doing anywhere from, you know, two, three, four deals a year. And it's just one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And now, you know, we have, you know, 50 people on staff or whatever it is. We're able to then at this point, maybe we'll look at two deals at once now, right? Because before it was literally like two to four a year and we're just buying larger deals. Yeah. Then you get to a point of scale, you're able to execute better, you have a clear strategy, then you can really start doing uh, you know, quite a few at, at once and really start growing fast. But look, in the beginning, you can, you can be done with corporate America within three years by doing one rental at a time. So I do believe there's a lot of truth to that. And Michael, my partner is a big Game of Thrones fan. So for any, any Game of Thrones fans out there, what did Danny say? You don't know how to ride a dragon until you ride a That's dragon. Right, right? <laughs> it's, just like, it's just like multifamily. You don't know how to buy multifamily until you buy multifamily. It's just like that in life. I think if you pull the trigger, baby, you just got to do it. Out. And, and you don't have to start with 150 units. You can start with a three unit or a five unit or an FHA, 223 or whatever, whatever, whatever it is you need to get into. Just start out with a duplex house hack. And then if you like it, great. If you don't, that's even better. So you don't have to waste your time yeah. doing it. But I'm sure that if you start, you will like it. You will become, I mean, Jake on our first deal, I remember, I'll never forget it. He gets his, he gets all the cash. I, I tell everybody, don't take cash from your tenants. But when that first, that first time he got the cash, he laid it on his countertop. He started taking <laughs> pictures of me. It was like, like, it was like Biggie Smalls, baby. We're just rolling it <laughs> in the background. We were just crushing. Okay. So that will addict you to roll the rentals. When people are paying you and you're W2, that'll like, the light switch will go on real quick on that one. So um, think big, but start small. You don't have to start with 100 units. We started with a 25 unit, and there was three of us. My brother like cigarettes partner. too. All the money smelled like cigarettes. I remember it very. <laughs> <laughs> So that was a long intro, Michael, but I guess, I guess just a little All bit right, of flavor. I thought, the show. I thought we were out of here. <laughs> no, no, it's been awesome. I have so many questions. I take notes feverishly. So when you see me writing, it is, it is taking notes. So actually, I want to go back to day zero, pre-first 25 units, if you don't mind. And sure. I want to do that is because both of you spoke to it, but I want to remind people that 2010, 2011, in hindsight, looks like a steal, mm -hmm. but it was, it was very risky to get started, right? The, the financial system had grind to a halt. Real estate investors were the devil. Um, you know, we caused the crash because I've been doing this since 03, right? So I saw it and experienced with you. Mm -hmm. Let's just remind people about uh, that 18 month time investment before your first deal, right? That so was it, hard it, and comfortable. Go for it. 
You know, it, it was really, uh, I guess, weird for us because Knoxville was like the third or fourth city to get out of the recession. So we actually saw the light of day a little bit sooner than a lot mm. of other cities did. So, you know, real estate is really micro. We look at it as a macro picture, but there's four cycles in, 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 a, in a market, right? There's the re recession, recovery, expansion, and then hypersupply. And every market is in a different phase and you need to know which different phase. So Knoxville really got out of that uh, uh, recession phase a lot quicker than a lot of others. But at the same time, rental rates were suppressed and occupancy was like in the low 90s, right? Mm. They still had a lot, and but jobs were coming down. That was the thing. Jobs are coming back to Knoxville. And it was, you know, a lot of New Yorkers are moving down there. And it was a right to work state. It was a no state in tax environment. So people were, were already migrating down there. And we saw the trends going up. Not that we knew. We just got lucky. We picked a good market. But at the same time, do you remember? It was 1.5% growth. There was, no, there was no confidence in the economy. And there was no money out there. That's why nobody was syndicating because you couldn't raise money. No. So these big deals were, were out of – so if you have $100 million in cash in the bank and you're buying these assets, yes, great. But 98% of us can't do that or yeah. couldn't do that at the time. And it was risky. And we were buying these deals. And can we rent them out? I mean – can we get 375? Can we get rubs? We weren't sure. We were just dumb enough that we, we did it. We took action. And But Michael, the important thing was that we really were educated. I really did a lot of real estate training. I really learned how to underwrite deals. I really knew how to manage them because I had owned other rental properties. I, I sort of had the idea of, of what we needed to do once we took them under control because our three-step framework is buy right, manage right, and finance right. And that's what, that's what we came up with from buying these first few deals and from thinking about let's execute on the buy side, if we can buy these things right with certain parameters, if we can finance them with long-term debt, we were going to community financing the first few deals and rolling it over into agency. That's, that's yeah. what our strategy was because they were too small the first couple to go into agency. So use a community bank. It's recourse debt. I mean, sue me. I yeah. Take whatever I have. I don't have that much anyways. <laughs> So that was my mindset. Jake, what was yours? I mean, I, I just... Well, I think there's a golden nugget here, though, because he, he, that's when everyone says, oh, it was simple because you, you were buying it the, the down and it, you waited for everything to go up. But there's a key to this because in 2016 in Knoxville, this guy right here, Gino and I poo-pooed a lot of would-be very good deals yes. because we were buying at thirty dollars and $40,000 a door. And we saw 50 or 55, even though a cash flowed, we're saying, holding our nose saying, no, it's too much, too rich. And then the same deal a couple of years later traded for 70 a door. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, they purchased at 55 within like two years, they exited it at 70. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, they, they didn't even let their IO burn off. And so they did nothing to it. They went in, probably put very little into it and came out on a, you know, 200 unit complex, $15,000 per door. Mm -hmm. I, I would have, I, I'll take that deal every day of the week. So, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you got to be careful as you're going through this, not to turn your nose up at something that actually makes sense on paper. And that's when we talk about the buy right portion of our framework. Get clear on where you are at, on a cap rate perspective. Get clear on your debt service coverage ratio because obviously the agencies went in and, and financed these things. So you're able to get the, them on as investors. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think the key to this is, you know, throughout all phases of the cycle, be open to it and really try to be someone that is able to sniff out the value because there was an instance there where we we cost ourselves a lot of money because we could have made a lot by being a little bit more aggressive and not, you know, being so rigid. You know, I, I believe in being very disciplined, buying on actual numbers, but at the same time, we could have made a lot of money on a few of these deals that we missed. And Jake, it was funny. It took Hurricane Irma for me to get up there. Uh, in That's, what That's what it in takes. That's what it takes. September. <laughs> I moved to Florida in June of 2017. Two months later, in North Florida, we get hit with Hurricane Irma. So I'm evacuating to, to uh, Knoxville for the week with the entire family. There's eight of us in this minivan. We're getting stuck in traffic because there's nowhere to go. 95 North, and that's it, and going through that. So I get to Knoxville, and I spend the whole week there, and we revisit a deal that we had let go six months prior. And if we had not bought this deal, I'd be shooting myself in the foot because it was a six, almost a seven cap on an A property. We've already refied both parts of it out. We have no money left in the deal. And these things are cash flowing really well. And it's just because, you know what? We couldn't pay that much. We've never bought this kind of asset. We didn't understand that it was a, it was a, um, a condominium with a homeowners association and the expenses were really low because it's a brand new property. So we, we didn't understand what we didn't know. And I just think everybody on there, follow the market. If you're buying stuff three years ago at seven cap, 
less. That's not where the market is now. Um, you have to buy right. You have to know what part of the cycle to buy. You might not be able to refi and roll in this part of the cycle, but you may be able to buy for long-term, 10-year term debt where you can ride out the next wave, make sure cash flows really well, hold it longer term, and then when the yield maintenance burns off or whatever, you either want to refi or sell it. You just have to know what strategy you're trying to employ. And more importantly than anything else, what is your exit strategy on the property you're buying? Whatever investment you're doing, whether it's whole life, whether it's a stock, whether it's a rental property, whether it's a single family, whether it's a mobile home park, why are you buying it? What are you trying to achieve? And what is your exit strategy or your long-term vision for the property? That's, that's awesome. So let's take your three-step buy right, manage right, finance right, and let's break that down on your first deal, which I think you said was a 25-unit building. Do you remember the rough, rough numbers on, on that story? I do. We, we purchased the property for $600,000. So we bought it right because we had bought it at like an 11, 11 and a half cap. And it wasn't a good area. Just the tenants were terrible. And what year? So, I'm sorry. 2013. It was 2013. Okay. The reason why we bought it at such a high cap was it was a weekly renter. So it's uh, one of those transition, not transitional money, housing. Too. Yeah. The cash, the income was tremendous, but the problem was the expenses were tremendous too. So we had a real big management play on it. So it took us about a year to reposition the tenants and get that income up. Income basically stabilized, but those expenses, they had a $7,000 cable bill. We knocked right. off utilities were huge. They had, um, it was a mom and pop. They had no systems. They were letting anybody in there. Um, we had 10% owner financing on that deal too. So we only needed to come up with around $80,000 with closing costs mm. between the three of us. So 600,000, um, we, we ended up getting a crappy, uh, loan on it. We only got a 20 year amortization on that deal. The rate was 6% mm -hmm. and it was a five year term. The reason why we did that is because the bank allowed us to do owner financing and we knew in that part of the strategy, in that part of the cycle, we could refi and roll that. So within 18 months, December of 2015, we refinanced that property. We pulled out $170,000. So we pulled, we pulled out an additional $80,000 above and beyond the money we had in there. Our rate went to 425, mm. our amortization went to 25 years, and our term went to seven. So we actually, our payment is the same as it was on the original note, and you know, income is up. So we're, we're still drawing about three grand a month from that property, and it's a wonderful property. We've really repositioned it. Jake, I saw the pictures. We've got all metal roofs on the property. It looks really nice. They've done a, we've done a nice job with it. It's, it was a mixed-use property where we had some cottages, single families. We had a six-unit efficiency. It's one of those deals where you get into in your first deal. We won't do that now now, but yeah. on our first or second or third deal, it's one of those real value adds because there's a lot of value to add in that property. The yeah. tenant base was terrible. The, 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 the management was terrible. You know, what, what was it called? We would call it Crack Den. That's what we oh, called no, it. So. No, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, oh, it was called the Shamrock the Motel. Shamrock Hotel, was, yes. The sixth unit that was they were using as a motel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So, so is it still I mean, weekly? Is it still weekly or do you feel No, we, we, we took about a year to transition every now from weekly. The problem with weekly renters, it's great. They'll pay 700 bucks a month going and weekly. They also have, they have uh, teardrop tattoos as well. So. <laughs> And, and it's constantly turning the units, constantly getting people in there. You got bed bugs and all that, and they just don't stay. And it's really management intensive. And you will get burned out from that property, no doubt about it. You can cash flow like crazy, but it's just a very hard, it's a hard business model. It's a hard, uh, you know, yeah. man, asset to manage. I was going around, you know, like trying to meet people at McDonald's on the weekends, trying to collect cash. I had this burner <laughs> cell phone. And it was a complete mess. We didn't know, like, you know, we, we knew what we were doing, but we were really bad at it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You the rough steps, but there really wasn't any method to your madness. We've, nope. we've, we've constantly focused on improvement and systems, you know, since that point. We've gotten, you know, tremendously better. But, uh, you know, you got to bootstrap in the beginning and, and oh, figure yeah. it out as you go. So, oh, and that's good. the thing. We had, we we're doing QuickBooks at the time. So now we've got a folio. I would recommend people to use some type of property management software when they start out. Don't let, you know, and that was our, one of our biggest blunders is just waiting to get that real good property management software. Cause I think we were just cheap and we didn't know any better. We thought, but getting really good accounting getting really good systems on actually get hiring a bookkeeper and letting somebody help you with that will alleviate a lot of time to look at deals and to manage the assets. So that was, that was one of our learning lessons for sure. Yeah, yeah. this is great. And one of the things I want to sort of tie into this is I believe today what I'll call C class properties, which this one may have been a D plus property, but you know, mm -hmm. we've all owned C class. I think today, again, I don't know Knoxville, but certainly in Fresno is priced for perfection. People are treating them and putting them at cap rates that are frankly B quality. So mm -hmm. I am very, very nervous about new investors using Excel math to buy C class properties. And then they're going to get crushed because when the downturn happens, I mean, the business cycle happens, those people live paycheck to paycheck. 
They're going to have huge amounts of turns. And that's what kills landlords is turns, right? Mm -hmm. So do you see it the same way? I mean, this whole- We've seen a lot of C-class getting priced up. And that's why we've actually been, we we're looking at an A-class property the other day we were, we were uh, bidding on. It was actually performing from a cash flow perspective much better than a lot of the C properties we'd underwritten prior to that. So yeah. you got to be very aware at this part of the cycle. And, and that's what I'm saying, know you, knowing your parameters, because if we weren't open to it, not that we still missed on the A property, but- you know, who knows? We, we were not that far off either. Yeah. So you got to be open to these, these differences and not just poo poo it and say, this is not us. We don't, we don't do a class like that because I'm telling you right now that a property we underwrote a few weeks ago was performing better than a lot of the C product that people have basically bubbled up to this point and, and overvalued. So yes. yeah, I think you be open. And, and that's why when brokers say, what are your parameters? What are you looking at? I'm like everything because you guys don't always like yeah. know how a look at it. So just keep them coming, boys. That's yeah. right. Your yeah, opinion is not my opinion. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. The, the other important thing is the problem with C properties is a lot of value add. Everyone's got quintessential value add or modern affordability. Everyone's got the value add. And the problem is they go in there, price them up. They put pig on a lipstick, uh, lipstick on a pig. I'm sorry. They try to really, you know, blast them out and it's still a 1970s product you're still trying to compete with the a that's where the risk is because if you've got a 1970s product and you're trying to price it and get the 200 dollars premium rents when the market does correct those people in that product the a product is going to drop rents they're going to become competitive with your c product and those c's are going to go to the a's so if you have a c and maintain it as C, I think you'll be okay if you can buy it properly because we just bought a property back in december at 26 a door we'll probably be in it for 30,000 a unit mm. that's a refi and roll but that's one of those where if the market takes a hit those tenants are going to be fine where they are because they're not going to up to an a product because right. it's not the type of property so you just have to be careful if you're buying a c to reposition to an a that's where there's a lot of risk involved because you still have an old asset it's still functionally obsolescent i'd rather go to an a property with a cafe and a fitness center and a clubhouse and a pool than a 1970s c that's got you know some new paint on it so that's yeah. where you, people have to be careful yeah excellent point gino i love that uh, and then the other thing I want to talk about that you highlighted in your intro is the three of you uh, did a thousand doors with quote unquote your own money via cash out refis and, and all of that over what time frame? So that started in 13. Was that through 16 or how, how long does it take to get a thousand units? That's Jake, as fast as you can go. So you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, that was uh, I would say we crossed that just uh, towards the eight, it was five years basically for us to uh, go from zero to a thousand within five years. And what we what were doing is we we're buying uh, one deal at a time, one rental at a time, maybe a bunch of rentals at a time, but anywhere from you know, 20 to 300. And we were buying them with 15% down via community bank. And then we were refinancing sometimes again to community bank because we had one deal where the rents were 450 and now they're probably on average right around 750. Mm -hmm. so there's, wow. a huge, there's a huge gap there. And we were, we were buying things 29 to $35,000 a door, two bedroom garden style apartments. So we're going in, buying them, refining them once, maybe even twice, and then getting them off our balance sheet to agency debt, Fannie, Freddie, and yeah. whatnot. So then we were taking the proceeds. Gino was going out and buying Ferraris. I was reinvesting the money into the properties. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All the money was going back into the deals. So yes. we, we weren't going out there and, and you know buying the Lambos and stuff and the gold chains. We were taking the money, repurposing it into the next deal. So you know, we'd go in get a couple of deals a year, refi them, buy the next ones and, and just, you know, and then we were cash flowing really strong too. So all that cash flow, we were saving it. And then the refi proceeds we're, we're putting all back into uh, investing. And Michael, it's a long game. I mean, I always, I like to use the farmer analogy where you have a raised bed where there's just dirt. You've got to put manure, you've got to prepare it. And you know, I've got, I've got kid labor. So I've got my kids planting the garden. So I use them. Right. But it's a long process. It's a good six month process where you need to do it. And I think multifamily is the same thing. It took us, like I said, 15 to 18 months on the first deal yeah. to refi it out. But that's a great paycheck at the end of the 18 months. You've got an asset that you have no more money left in it. You've got a lot of equity and you've got a lot of control and it's 80% LTV still. And I think it's even better. I think it's like 65% LTV since the, uh, since it's appreciated, but that's what you want to do. But you have to put it in your mindset. It might take you 15 to 18 months to buy the deal. Then it might take you another 15 to 18 months to get that thing stabilized, reposition, whatever. So that's why Jake said three years. Sure. And then if you cost segregate that thing, you can wipe off some of your taxes. So that's where the swell starts coming. And you have to be disciplined to say, 
I can enjoy some of this money, but at the same time, the majority of this money needs to go and needs to go back into another deal or into another venture. Um, and that's what the cool thing about it with us was we were able to do that and we were all on board and you know, we were lucky in, in the, in the sense that we did a couple of owner finance deals, which helped us out also. And we had a great relationship with the community bank that really propelled us and that really helped us out a lot. Yeah. So the three, the three year time frame was how long it took me to get out of corporate America. And the thing that my company would do because they were going through the, the Sunshine Act and there was all this healthcare reform was they would tell you once a year to go sit by your phone and we'll let you know if you have a job or oh. not. So it was this one year thing where it's like, okay, we're going to go kept, you know, reevaluating the sales force. Yeah, let's see what it looks like next year. Yeah. And so finally within my third year, I was able to, you know, kind of flip the script and I, I took my boss to a Taco Bell ordered a uh, chicken quesadilla, which is, they're just fabulous. I think people talk about <laughs> fast food, but, but listen, one thing before we get to the story, every fast food place, if it's McDonald's and the egg McMuffin, or if it's, uh, you know, Taco Bell and the chicken quesadilla, you can find a little gem in each one of these places. So stop hating everybody. It's okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I, was, I was enjoying my, my chicken quesadilla and, and uh, unsweet tea. And I just, you know, said to my boss, you know, we've, we've kind of come to the end of the run here and I, I appreciate, you know, all the opportunities, but, uh, this is this is the end of the run, and we're gonna we're gonna part ways. And we had a nice, quiet uh, drive back to Knoxville. Was <laughs> You're in the car together, bro. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I sit there like you know, real shitty and grin on my face, and I, like she was like, "Did this guy just break up with me?" <laughs> like, so what the hell is he gonna do? You know, I, I, you know, I didn't. I kept it very quiet. Like no one knew uh, in my corporate job that I was massing this portfolio, uh, alongside Gino. So awesome. it was, uh, you know, cause I didn't know how they would, they would take it. Not that it was a business, but, uh, you know, at the same time wanted to you know, keep that private. So oh, that's awesome. Like that's Gino, awesome. Gino kept it from his mom. We all got dirty real estate. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't support you, then they don't got to know. That's my bottom line. And my mom, you know, it's not that she hated me. She just, you know, when you ever hear you've got six mouths to feed and you're taking a risk, I always tell people a W2 job is just as risky and a small business is just as risky as investing in real estate because at least I have control. At least I can raise the rents. At least I can, you know, sell the property. I can refi. I can control the asset. But when you have a W-2 job or you have, like I did, a small restaurant where the competition is completely changed right now. If you're not online, if you're not delivering food, if yeah. you're not cutting, you see what's happening with minimum wage is 15 bucks an hour for a waitress. Seriously, dude? I mean, yeah. come on. That's just, that's just that's just that's going to actually wipe out jobs like you wouldn't believe. And, and I always tell people that it is risky, but everything's risky. So yeah. um, I'd rather invest in myself and invest in something that I can control. And that's how I saw multifamily and real estate one rental at a time. That's you're taking control of your own destiny. That's awesome. So I'm curious, it sounds like this started in Knoxville. Did the first thousand units stay in Knoxville or did you go to other areas or in, in where are you guys? Yeah, we're, we're in, we're in three markets now. So we're in uh, two markets in Kentucky, Lexington and Louisville, and then uh, the Knoxville market. We're looking at anything because we are a vertically integrated group and we manage all of our portfolio in house, anything within about a four hour radius right now where we're looking at. And that's great because it, that covers uh, middle Tennessee. It covers, you know, all of Kentucky, the Carolinas, Georgia, uh, we could get to Huntsville, so Chattanooga, just great markets around us. So we are, yeah. we are poised and, and in a great position. We like all those markets. So, you know, we don't really, uh, I, I'd, I'd be open to getting beyond that. But right now, I think we're in a really good spot and I think it'll help manage and scale our growth. And Michael, the important thing is though, when we started out, we did really learn the Knoxville market. I would tell everyone who's, out, who's starting out as a new investor, really learn and crush one market. Focus on that one market. Figure out what the demographics are. Figure out where you want to invest. Because like say, for instance, Jacksonville, there's nine or 10 sub markets. Just because Jacksonville is a five cap market doesn't mean the whole city is. So you really should focus on one market. Really learn it well network with the brokers and then from there start trying to buy and if you don't like that market move to another one but if you're looking at three or four different markets in the beginning it's hard because you whatever you focus on grows and if you're focusing on three different markets and trying to call seven different brokers and underwriting all these deals which which are you know every market's got different cap rates different expenses different incomes so you really should focus on one market in the very beginning and like we did as we grew we were able to you know hire on and we got we started our syndication company we brought someone else on with that company he was able to start underwriting more deals and you have to visit the market and you have to network with these brokers. So you've got to spend time in other markets. It's not going to happen overnight or through Zoom meetings. You really make deals when you go to the market and do these property tours. That's where the value comes in. So if you can't do that, focus on a market that you can do that in. That's awesome. Well, I know you guys are doing lots of things to help people, educate people. Why don't you go ahead and share how people can follow you, see what you guys are offering? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest way to find us is uh, jakeandgino.com. Uh, but, you know, going back to it, we have, a, a, again, a vertically integrated group of companies. So we have a mortgage company that finances all our deals, Rand Capital. So you can go to randcapllc.com. It's a great company for folks that want to do their first agency deal or they want to expand and really shop the different agencies against each other. So that's uh, randcapllc.com. Uh, we have randpartnersllc.com because we found that some people like to be very hands-on and they want to invest, but other people have really good jobs. Maybe they work at Google, maybe they're an engineer and they just want to place their money with us. So we offer that to folks as well. And then for the folks that really want to, you know, pull themselves up and, and get it done, we have jakeandgino.com. That's where, you know, we're talking about today. We have a great live event in October. Uh, it's October 19th and 20th, right, Gino? Yep. Yep, 19th and 20th at the, the Gaylord Palms. We're going to have somewhere between six and 700 multifamily investors, you know, top-notch speakers from across the country. We're going to start announcing them very shortly. Uh, so that's going to be a phenomenal event. It grows every year, and, and we really enjoy doing that. But, uh, you know, for the, the people that believe education times action equals results, you know, you, you bring a, a positive attitude, you know, to us, and uh, we'll, we'll teach you the rest with our, with our coaching and uh, really try to, you know, get you over the hump so you're in the group that does multiple deals instead of just uh, dreaming about it and thinking it's a pie in the sky. And Jay Daddy, don't forget we've got the podcast. So go to the Jake and Gino channel on on, uh, on iTunes. We've got four we got four podcasts a week. We, I do one with my wife. It's called the Multifamily Zone. It's a great podcast for spouses, for people who want to work with their spouse about communication. It's more of a family podcast, and we intertwine business and, and multifamily with it. We do our our flagship Wheel of Our Profits, which is number one multifamily podcast on iTunes. Jake does a podcast with our partner Dylan on syndication, so that's a great fifteen to twenty minute hit every week. And then Josh and I are our community director we do one called movers and shakers where we have our students coming on and highlighting their deals so our students have done to date over 3,500 units we've they've closed on so we want to have them on and we want to highlight them because it's yeah. a, it's a really monumental thing even if you've done four it's units really changing for folks once you get into this because it can really you know you're allowed to take control of your life right you know yeah it's awesome I love listening to those stories every week and they get highlighted and all of a sudden they've got a YouTube video and they got some content they make I make them write articles I make them post articles on our blog so <laughs> it's great I mean like they, they, they get out of their shell and it's a love that's it. the network. That's how you let people know what you're doing. If they don't know what you're doing, they're never going to place money with you. So let them know what you're doing. Let them know you're doing multifamily. That's awesome, guys. You guys are doing such great stuff. Both the success, taking the risk, going to Knoxville six months by yourself, you know, getting that first deal, uh, your three keys of buy right, manage right, and finance right, helping people, these podcasts. I just want to thank you guys for giving back, uh, you know, sh t helping people take control of their lives. This has been a lot of fun. And I, Thank you very much. Thanks again, you know, Michael, for having us know, on. We got, we got one more thing to throw in here. You said about giving back. Yes. We fed 10,000 kids at Thanksgiving last year through our, our charitable organization, Rand Cares. We're going to do 15,000 this year. So when you, when you get on the, uh, the wheelbarrow profit string, keep a lookout for that because uh, more, more kids are getting <laughs> fed and we're giving back. That's I right. love that. Congratulations. Yeah. I'm glad you threw that in. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. All right. Take